firstly, a huge thank you to the Society for inviting me to talk. And I realise the cake has been cut and I've got a very, and I've got a very difficult slot to, to follow given how good the cake cutting was. What I want to do is give you a short presentation um, this, this afternoon. So East Lothian is a well-known, East Lothian is well-known as a leading agricultural district. As part of that reputation, it has been innovative in the way that it has used the land, grown and harvested crops, raised livestock, as well as developing and using implements and machines to undertake these activities. In this short paper, I will look at aspects of innovation relating to the development and use of agricultural implements and machines in East Lothian, especially in the 19th century. How did farmers and landowners hear about the innovations that they could use on their farms? Where could they purchase these innovations where could they purchase these innovative implements and machines? And what important innovations were developed and used in East Lothian? And in looking at this last question, I want to look at four different examples of how this took place in the county through different businesses and members of the agricultural community. Firstly, what do we mean by innovation? Very briefly, it is the practical implementation of ideas that result in the introduction of new products or things or services, or we can have improvements in existing ones. So an innovation could be the development of an entirely new agricultural implement or machine, or it could be an improvement to one or a number of them. So firstly, how did farmers and landowners in East Lothian become aware of innovations and the latest developments in implements and machines? There were a number of different me means available to them. In practice, their actual use could be complex, with a number being used to varying extents before a farmer or a landowner decided to purchase a new implement or machine. They might also be used in different ways at different times. Not all were available at the same time, and some were only at hand at particular times of the year or even less frequently, being, for example, specially arranged for members of the farming community. So what were the most important ones? Farmers learned from their neighbours and other members of the agricultural community. This could be from, discuss from discussing developments at the markets, including the corn exchange at Haddington, or seeing new implements at work, for example, on a neighbouring or a nearby farm. They were also influenced by their neighbours. For example, the new Toronto binder introduced from Canada into East Lothian in 1886 could be seen at work on seven farms in the Haddington district. They also read about developments in the newspaper press. And this was especially important in the second half of the 19th century through the local county newspapers, such as the Haddington Advertiser. And the Scottish agricultural press emerged from the late 1840s through the North British Agriculturalist, published in Edinburgh, and later from the 1893 The Scottish Farmer, which we still have today. They included a wide range of news, features, including adverts from implement and machine makers and other news of agricultural affairs. There was also formal opportunities through the county agricultural societies, as well as the national one, the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. In East Lothian, the county societies held a range of events that included agricultural shows. These were an important forum for the exhibition of new and existing implements and machines. The East Lothian Agricultural Society show, and then from the 1880s, the United East Lothian Agricultural Society show, enabled the agricultural community in the county and beyond to see what was available from local makers, as well as others from much further afield. 
Compared to some of the county shows held elsewhere in Scotland, those in East Lothian had a significant sized implement department. In 1875, for example, the East Lothian Agricultural Show had a, quote, large and varied selection of implements. Four years later, there were some 447 implements exhibited at the United East Lothian Agricultural Society show. However, in 1882, at a time of agricultural difficulty, there was only 144. The range of manufacturers, manufacturers at them was well summed up in an account of the show in 1886. It noted that the exhibition, quote, can be said to have been thoroughly representative and to have contained excellent specimens of almost all classes of agricultural machinery required by East Lothian farmers and some implements stated not to be much used here. Trials and demonstrations were important for showing implements and machines at work and they were usually held during the season when they were to be used. Some of them were held privately, arranged by a farmer for his neighbours and acquaintances. However, the most important ones were the public ones, held by the agricultural societies, either at a county or national level, and there were some by the implement makers and agents. And they played a key role at times when there were significant technological developments, such as the introduction of steam ploughing engines and their associated tackle, or reapers and binders for harvesting the grain crop. Most of them were competitive, demonstrating a number of implements by different manufacturers at the same time, so that they could be compared to one another. For example, a reaping machine competition held under the auspices of the East Lothian Agricultural Association at Yester in September 1861 attracted an entry of 18 machines that ranged from locally made ones to those of the principal Scottish and English makers. So where did the farmers and landowners purchase their implements and machines? In East Lothian, especially from the early 19th century onwards, they purchased their tools, implements and machines from a number of businesses in the county. They included the local blacksmiths, usually operating on a parish or a group of parishes. And with the increase in implement and machine making, especially from the mid 19th century, some larger businesses emerged that specialised in their manufacture. The census of 1851 records only a small number of implement works throughout Scotland. One of them was at West Barnes Dunbar, that of Thomas Sheriff. Other manufacturing businesses in the county became increasingly more important. Rose Hall Works, Haddington by 1854, Sumner Field Works, Haddington by 1869, Flora Bank, Haddington, by 1890, and Bridge End Implement Works at East Linton by 1909. However, their number and size of production was relatively small by comparison to those in other counties, especially ones near the industrial west of Scotland, such as Lanarkshire and parts of Ayrshire. By the 1890s, there was a growing trend for implement and machine makers to not only manufacture their own implements and machines for sale, but to also act as agents for other ones, thus providing a one-stop shop for their purchase. We've got also other businesses, including ironmongers, such as Brown and Murray at Haddington, also selling hand tools, implements and machines. But we've also got implement and machines also being purchased from makers in other districts and especially important were those in Edinburgh Midlo as well as Midlothian and Berwick-on-Tweed. In the 1870s to the 1890s for example in Edinburgh they included Thomas Gibson and Sons Fountain Bridge and a and J Main and Company which was more usually associated with its Glasgow premises. From further afield in Ayrshire we had Alexander Jack and Sons of Maybole and a and W. Pollock of Mochlin being important. 
Farmers and landowners also purchase second-hand implements and machines, and this could be privately, for example, through adverts and newspapers, as well as publicly, and most important public ones were, for example, the displenishing sales arranged by auction houses and markets, for example, at the end of an agricultural lease. So now that we know how farmers and landowners became aware of innovations and the latest developments and where they could purchase them from, I want to look at four examples of how innovation took place in the county through people and businesses who were introducing innovations in implements and machines in East Lothian. The first is through perhaps the most important implement and machine maker in East Lothian, Although there were only a small number of implement works in the county, the best known one was that of Thomas Sheriff. Its location was pinpointed by the North British Agriculturalist in 1893. It said, those who travel to London on the East Coast route will observe at West Barnes, shortly before reaching Dunbar Station, a very neat red brick building labelled in large letters, Agricultural Implement Works. Thomas Sheriff started his business in 1816. A few months after his unexpected death in December 1856, his widow, Agnes Punton, also known as Mrs. Thomas Sheriff, took over the business. It was called Mrs. Thomas Sheriff. She ran it until her retiral on the 19th of June 1871, when she assigned it to Robert Robertson, the works manager, who had started in the works in 1851. On taking it over, the business became known as Thomas Sheriff and Company. He managed it until his death in the mid-1900s. In September 1941, it became a company limited by guarantee. So it's Thomas Sheriff and Company Limited. Its main subscriber then was Thomas Sheriff Robertson, Although Thomas died shortly afterwards in September 1945, the business continued. Today, you'll recognise the company's name throughout East Lothian and beyond. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the business specialised in the growing, in sewing and cultivating implements and machines. In 1893, its manufacturers were described as drill and broadcast sewing machines. And you've got an example of one in the, in the slide there. In, later, in 1911, it was said to have a varied collection of grain drills, broadcast sewing machines, and turnip and mangled drills. Again, more sewing implements. It also man manufactured other agricultural implements. Thomas Sheriff widely exhibited at agricultural shows, including ones in the county and the national one of the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. It entered competitions and trials, including those of the aforementioned society and international ones. It was eminently successful at them, winning numerous awards. There were few businesses in Scotland that had received as many. By 1893, it had, quote, the NBA had taken no fewer than 64 medals and prizes at the various shows that they have attended. In March 1887, they were listed as 11 gold medals, 12 silver medals, 8 bronze medals and 31 money prizes. And that was awarded in competition with the best makers. These included one, in one example, of a competition against 30 other makers, including the best English and Scotch ones at the Dutch International Exhibition in 1872, where it won the first prize gold medal for the best corn and seed drill. Wow, that is really impressive. It also won drill trials, such as one for sewing machines arranged by the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland in 1888 in competition with 12 other machines. It was awarded first prize for its sewer, which then just became known as the first prize broadcast sewer. Sheriff's implements and machines were well known. In 1857, Mrs. Thomas Sheriff noted that 
they are extensively used in East Lothian by the first farmers. In April 1863, the business was completing an order for a set of the most improved machines that was to be sent to India. In 1893, the agricultural press noted that its sewing machines, quote, are to be found at work in all parts of the world. The sheriff implements and machines had a sound reputation. In 1863, the illustrated Berwick Journal noted that, quote, the well-known firm of Sheriff at West Barnes has acquired something more than a local notoriety for the excellence of their manufacturers. By 1899, it had, quote, for many years enjoyed a great reputation for their drills. And similar comments were made in following years. And in 1924, it was described as, quote, a firm with a long-standing reputation as makers of seed sewing machinery. Why did the business have such a reputation? Its manufacturers were well-designed, well-made, and importantly, of great utility to the farmer. In 1861, they were, quote, manufactured on the most improved principle. They were continually improved and they included all the latest improvements for the season. In 1899, its drills, for example, its drills had been brought up to date by the introduction of improvements suggested by experience. Even in 1924, it, they continued to have a well-established reputation for good workmanship. And Mrs. Sheriff had suggested that her manufacturers are the best that can be used. As they were practical implements and machines, Sheriff's concepts and patterns were adopted and used by other makers and came into more wider use. For example, in July 1891, its two-row turnip drill was described as an implement which has been taken as a type by a large section of the trade, so everybody's following the sheriff model. It was, importantly, the first maker to bring out what was called the land measuring index, which was attached to sewing machines, by which the quantity of seed per acre can be accurately measured. Imagine being able to know how much seed you're, you're sowing per acre. What a great idea and a very practical one too. So second thing that I want to look at is farmers as implement makers. So what, what I want to do is um, show you um, the experience of at least one farmer who became an implement maker. This was David Wilson of East Linton. And through him, the county had a role in the development and manufacture of machines to raise or harvest the potato crop and also to grade or dress it. Many of the leading makers for these machines were actually in other districts of Scotland, such as Ayrshire and Perthshire, which were also large potato growing districts. Now, I wasn't able to find any pictures of David Wilson's um, developments, but what I've done is I've substituted some photos. So we've got our chitting trays on the left, left hand side, or potato digger or spinner in the middle, and or dresser at the right hand side. And I'll talk about them in a, just now. So David Wilson came to East Linton in 1904 from Rickerton Farm in Linlithgow, West Lothian, where he had been a farmer. By 1914, he was recorded at the Bridgeside Implement Works. The reason for his coming to East Lothian was recorded in the West Lothian Courier after his death in 1929. It said, he invented an agricultural implement which caused him to give up farming and leave Linlithgow for East Lothian, where he developed a successful business as a result of his genius. So he was developing implements and machines which were really of a lot of use to the East Lothian farmers that were growing a lot of tatties. After he started business in East Lothian, he developed, patented and manufactured a number of implements and machines. As an article in the Scotland in 1922, he had been responsible for many valuable 
improvements in the world of agricultural implements. His first one was a potato dressing machine, which was described of great utility, which promises to bear a part in economising farm labour. Another one included boxes for sprouting seed potatoes or chitting trees for the first earlies. By 1907, his manufacturers included a potato dresser, a patent farmyard manure spreader, a patent thistle and weed cutter, a potato digger and a cowp cart. In 1911, he had available for sale a representative collection of potato implements. And he also continued to improve the efficiency of his machines. For example, in 1912, he had modified his potato digger so that it could more easily handle the potato shaws or tops. That was actually quite a challenging thing to be able to do. David was ambitious with his implements and machines, and he wanted to make sure that they were well known and had an extensive market. In 1907, he exhibited them at the Royal Agricultural Society of England, the RASE, show at Lincoln. He was one of a small number of Scottish makers to do so. I mean, going, taking your Scottish implements down to the Royal Show was really big stuff. Three years later, his potato razor attracted considerable interest at that show. And he continued to attend and exhibit it at it in following years. In 1919, he was one of 16 Scottish exhibitors. That's how, that's how few Scottish folk are going down south to exhibit at it. And he was one of 81 makers that entered an implement in the new implement class. It was very, very competitive. And he entered his potato digger or razor. David entered a number of machines into the trials of the National Agricultural Societies in Scotland and England. This included the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland's trials of potato razors in 1911. That was a really big one. And it won an equal prize to the other three machines on the ground. In that year, he also entered his potato digger and potato sorter into the um, royal trials near Spalding. It was reported that under these conditions, the potato digger made excellent work, leading, leaving the tubers undamaged in a nice narrow space, most handy to gather. That is really good to be able to do that for. Um, by 1918, he advertised that machine with reference to one of these trials. As it notes, the Highland Society report says, less labour in gathering than any other type of machine. In 1919, he entered a two-row machine for topping and tailing turnips at the trials of the Highland and, Island, Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. He was awarded a number of prizes for his implements and machines, and they included a special medal for a new potato razor at the East Lothian Show in 1912, an award of merit for a new potato razor at the Holland potato show at Spalding in 1921. So he's really making his way into the really big Lincolnshire potato growing districts there. I want to now turn to look at farmers as agents. Farmers recognised the importance of particular implements and machines for use on farms in East Lothian. Some of them became agents for the sale of particular implements and machines so that they could introduce them ensure that they were more widely used within the county and further afield, sometimes for the whole of Scotland. Holding an agency could be prestigious, especially if it was for a national or an international business. In 1886, William Ford, the farmer at Fenton Barnes Drem, visited the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in London where he saw the Massey Manufacturing Company's Toronto Light Binder in the Canadian exhibit. Although it had been used for a number of years in Canada, where there were several thousands of them at work, this was the first time that it had been exhibited in Britain. Recognising the potential of this lightweight and compact binder, he ordered a consignment of them from Toronto. By the 1st of September that year, he had one working on his farm. 
he arranged and advertised a demonstration of it on his farm, working alongside one of the celeb what was called the celebrated binders of Hornsby of Grantham, one of the leading English makers. He must have been persuasive for the man Massey Manufacturing Company sent its expert along to his demonstration. The agriculturalists who saw the new binder at work were thoroughly satisfied with it in his first season and its use was described as an unqualified success. So we've got an advert for it. It's not very clear. So what I've done is got slightly more modern um, binders from the tractor era um, just to show you how binders work. So William was reported to have introduced the machine into Scotland. By April 1887, he had become its agent in Scotland and he continued to place orders for it in Canada and act as the Scottish agent until 1889. And he continued to sell the machine until 1892. By this time, the Massey Company had set up an office in London it then moved its agency to a well-known implement and machine maker in the northwest, in the northeast of Scotland, G. W. Mar Murray of the Banff Foundry, uh, who was a very, very important um, implement maker. So William widely promoted the Toronto binder. As noted, I've said he held a public demonstration of it on his farm in September 1886. And this was attended by over 50 prominent agriculturalists and other gentlemen. He also advertised it in the Scottish Agricultural Press, in the North British Agriculturalist from the 6th of April 1887 until the 11th of August 1892. He exhibited it at the major agricultural shows that had extensive implement departments. And they included those of the Agricultural Societies of East Lothian, the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland, what, the one at Ayr, Strathairn, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And show reports commented favourably on it, also noting each year where there had been improvements made to it. The binder quickly gained popularity. In July 1887, a report of the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland show reported it to be, quote, a feature of great interest especially to people who have read of its utility on the harvest field. By, by the following April, it was recorded as gaining in popularity among Scotch agriculturalists. Two years later, it had, quote, gained quite an unprecedented popularity amongst the class who require binders. The next thing that I want to briefly look at is steam ploughing. Another use of innovation in East Lothian was the adoption of new technologies by farmers themselves. A key development in 19th century agriculture in the county and throughout Britain was the application of steam to a range of activities, including ploughing and cultivation, threshing and pulverising foodstuffs. And it was in the application and use of steam to ploughing and cultivation and the extent to which this was used in the county, that the county was seen to be one that was not only high in agricultural improvement, to quote, but also, quote, preeminent one in Scotland. This was because the use of steam ploughing and cultivation involved a major investment in terms of capital and expenditure. It, it also required to be used on large farms to make it economical and ones that had large fields and that was relatively easy to work. So we've got two sets of engines here, one from I think about the 1890s on the left, and one from 1956 on the right. While the earliest demonstrations of steam ploughing in Scotland were in the mid 1840s, the first one in East Lothian was in 1851. In that year, the Marquis of Tweedale had succeeded in bringing to a great degree of perfection a steam plough. He tested it out at Yester, his seat in East Lothian, and then used it for a number of years. However, he abandoned it owing to its cost. Although steam ploughing was being used commercially in other counties, such as Stirlingshire, Angus and Concardenshire in the late 1850s and the early 1860s, 
It was not officially introduced into East Lothian until 1862. This was by Mr Sadler, tenant of Ferry Gate Drem. The introduction on that farm, which was celebrated by a public demonstration and dinner and attendance by the local MP, was recorded in 71 newspapers across Britain and Ireland. A month later, newspapers reported the introduction of a second steam plough, this time by Mr Begbie at Queenston Bank. By the end of 1863, there were four sets of steam ploughs of varying designs used on four adjoining farms in the parish of Drem. Those at Ferrygate, Queenston Bank, Fenton Barns and Drem. In 1864, a further neighbour at Castle Mains was reported to have purchased a set. At this time, the Scotsman newspaper noted that, quote, we do not think that anywhere in the sister country can be witnessed a sight such as that to be seen in East Lothian at any time during the present season. By February 1866, that newspaper quote, commented that, quote, all the various methods of cultivation by steam may be seen within a radius of five or six miles in the county. By 1875, the North British agriculturalist was able to note that there were nearly 30 sets of steam ploughs in the county. That's quite a lot. These, it said, are mostly hiring sets and each set will work on an average of a dozen of farms. Start and do your maths. That's a lot of farms. After 1881, when the acreage under crop declined in the county and also nationally, so too did the use of steam ploughs. However, in 1903, the Berwickshire News suggested that, quote, steam cultivation is very much in evidence in East Lothian nowadays. No fewer than five steam ploughs are regularly at work in that county at the present time. However, the North British agriculturalists considered that this number was significant. It reported that, quote, certainly the enterprise displayed by so many East Lothian agriculturalists in equipping their farms with steam ploughing tackle is rather notable for probably no other county in Scotland, if not in Great Britain, can show five steam ploughs in regular use on its farm. We heard that a number of decades ago. Steam ploughing continued to be used in the county until at least the late 1940s, and that was at East Barnes Dunbar by Sir James Hope. And he also continued to use it in Northumberland until at least the late 1960. And it was the tenant farmers who led the way in introducing this expensive and innovative technology into the county when it became considered to be commercially viable. However, this did not mean that the landowners didn't support it. They too were interested in its introduction and they supported it by visiting the public demonstrations of it that were held by, organised and held by their tenants. And they visited them to see their machines at work. In some cases, these visits helped them to inform their own decisions on purchase. For example, the Earl of Caithness visited Mr Sadler to see his set of work, to see his set at work before publishing, before purchasing one for his own estate at Barrigal in Caithness. So in this short paper, I have looked at a number of aspects of the innovation of agricultural implements and machines in East Lothian. I've looked at the context for the farmers and the landowners to become aware of innovations and the latest developments and the ways in which they could purchase the implements and machines. As we saw, these were also used by the innovators who developed new and improved implements and machines in the county for, and for use within it. Innovations in the making of agricultural implements and machines were made by different businesses and members of the farming community in the county, as we've seen. So we've seen the example of the implement making business, the farmer who became an implement maker, other farmers acting as agents and leaders in using these technologies. And what they did, and 
what they had a very important role in doing was helping them to assure the status of East Lothian as a leading and an innovative agricultural district. Thank you very much.